ecosystem within higher educational institution that promotes research, innovation, and technology. Sir, you are muted. Dr. Shakil, you are muted, sir. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Shakil, sir. Shakil, sir, you are muted. You muted, sir. Now, voice is coming? Yes, yes. Now, we, okay, okay, uh, now okay. it's coming here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, as you all aware, that new education policy 2020 envisages a strong and vibrant research ecosystem within higher educational institutions that promotes research, innovation, and technology development. The societal challenges of our country can be addressed by integration of research, innovation, and technology development with higher education system. With the goal to strengthen the existing research ecosystem in higher educational institutions for reliable, impactful, sustained, and quality research, the UGC has launched an initiative to establish research and development cell in higher education system. The guidelines for the establishment of RDC in higher education institutions are available on the UGC website. The purpose of these guidelines is to put in place a robust mechanism for developing and strengthening the research ecosystem in higher education institutions aligned with the provisions of NEP 2020. It provides a clear-cut roadmap for the establishment of RDC with its objectives and function. Uh, you know that in order to understand and share the best practices which are being followed in different higher education institutions, UGC started to organize lectures of eminent persons followed by question and answers related to research and development cells so that they perform better and achieve the purpose of their establishment. The first lecture was organized on research and development cell and was delivered by Professor Nimisha Sharma. Today, we have very eminent person with us, uh, uh, Professor Anil, uh, <coughs> Anil Vali, sir. He is a uh, managing director foundation for innovation, technology transfer, and autonomous interface organization and Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Professor Ali Bali, sir, we welcome you and request you to deliver your lecture and give a presentation. And later on, we will interact with the director <laughs> of RDC and innovation technology transfer start and autonomous interface now, organization. Uh, and Professor Bali, sir, Indian. you start, please, your presentation. Is it visible? Yes, it is very much visible, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shakil, for uh, this uh, introduction and uh, Namaskar and a very good morning to all the participants and thanks for giving me the opportunity to be in a position to speak to you and maybe share experiences. I hope I'm audible. Yes, very much audible, sir. Well, I think uh, given the context that you talked about, I think this is the, the title which I thought uh, will go a little beyond this. But nonetheless, let me first come straight to the context in which uh, uh, we uh, have to, uh, let's say, in the, have a discourse or a dialogue on this subject. Uh, so uh, I always start with this uh, uh, say description of the roles or, or a traditional roles of a university system or even the R&D system, which has been... Uh, largely in the past focused on education, research, and knowledge dissemination. But going forward, so I'll not actually discuss some of the more disruptive challenges that we are facing as a society, but uh, I'll try to focus or remain focused on the task at hand. So in the contemporary world today, academia is also supposed to, uh, I mean, if you talk about the rules of academia, it's about resource mobilization, technology commercialization or transfer, collaboration with industry, entrepreneurship, which in many uh, institutes today is considered an important component of engineering education, promoting diversity and inclusion, and exploring the nexus of technology in society. I mean, these all uh, few points, I think, I hope you would agree, uh, are our subjects in themselves, which, which need a wider discourse and dissemination. But then 
I'll, I'll touch up on some of these uh, uh, in, in uh, my present day talk. Uh, so when we talk of resource mobilization, I'm here, uh, let's say, concentrating on the publicly funded institutions who, of course, traditionally have been uh, based on the grant support from the government. But while the private sector is in a position to mobilize resources on its own, apart from some supplementary grants from here and there, but for, for government uh, bodies also, I think this is becoming an important uh, um, source of, of uh, the institute funds. You would agree that uh, the publicly funded institutions particularly have multiple goals. And you would agree whether it's uh, teaching, research, and support of the public interest. And more importantly, these days, the fostering of regional economic development. I mean, it's while we create a talent pool, obviously talent pool has, go, has to go back to the society and, and, and serve there. Uh, so in this context, it's important to also understand the need for technology transfer or more broadly knowledge transfer, which happens between academia and industry at one level, but also the reverse is also true. And, uh, in particular, when we talk about the science and technology knowledge flows, so it could be through a variety of uh, avenues or routes. One is what is called a spillovers. It's, it could be uh, sponsored research, consulting assignments, research partnerships, and the movement of students, scientists, and faculty itself is a is a big uh, reason for knowledge to flow from one end to another. Technology licensing is the, the is the one which is commonly understood as as technology transfer, and then uh, uh, for quite some time, uh, spin outs or startups or research spin offs is a very very strong uh, model of uh, technology transfer or knowledge transfer. So it is in this context that we have to go uh, and and move on. Now, when we talk about uh, what uh, Dr. Shakil you said, I think it's uh, when we talk about uh, let's say uh, research. You know, I think uh, fundamentally the observation, this is just an observation, not a critique, is that many of our institutions are still not uh, culturally tuned to do research, or I would maybe make it more simple and say much of the research activities are just not happening or happening to uh, a level which is just perhaps not sufficient. Therefore, I think whether it's about culture or about R&D activities, I think uh, more of that should be seen in, in the higher education institutions. We can always keep aside uh, the more uh, better performing institutions, but this is about the, the general mass. So I think this is uh, what I think Dr. Shagir was alluding to. The UGC launched this initiative to establish a RDC, that is Research and Development Cell in HEIs, with a mandate for promoting quality research that contributes meaningfully towards the goal of self compliance. So that was what I actually also alluded to in one of my earlier slides. And then this has to be aligned with the provisions of uh, national education policy. So what is RDC supposed to do is actually create that ecosystem, the research ecosystem for reliable, impactful, and sustained research output. And in fact, I would give compliments to who has drafted uh, this policy report this, uh, about uh, creating a, a robust uh, research ecosystem in, in the country. And of course, uh, it in, includes generation of knowledge, transfer, okay, development for industrial research, Etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then and, and leveraging the intellectual capital, the human resources uh, that exist in our institutions. I mean, I have no hesitation in saying that I think we are one of the finest, we have some of the finest institutions. In fact, I think the base can become larger if I think there's more involvement of R&D activities in these institutions. And these are the objectives I took from the, the NEP ones, uh, from, from, the, from the, uh, the, the policy uh, report is to basically create an organizational structure. Now, this is more fundamental about structuring, uh, organizational structure with role-based functions of RDC, enable provisions for research policies, right? And establish an STV. Now, this is extremely important. I think uh, the, the import of uh, this, I'll maybe um, articulate in subsequent slides, act as a li liaison between researchers and re relevant research funding agencies have better coordination among different cells of the institute and also develop an institutional research information system. I'll give an example of this uh, with respect to IIT Delhi. So I think these are the broad uh, objectives that I think very nice objectives, very well formulated. I think even if we or organizations happen to, first of all, and to, to take the baby steps, do some of them, I think that would be a very good uh, beginning uh, to to uh, establish that research uh, culture or ecosystem in their respective institutions. 
Now, let me give the example of IIT Delhi because I think uh, this is one example in the country which uh, works on different models when it comes to, uh, let's say, developing that research and innovation ecosystem uh, in an in a academic environment. So, well, I think this is a holy grail the mission, which is, of course, uh, nicely put. But uh, I would want to draw your attention to some of the institutional mechanisms. I'm not saying all, some of the institutional mechanisms uh, which are uh, pointing towards these RDC, uh, that is the topic of this discussion. One is what we call as Industrial Research and Development, or IRD unit for short, at IIT Delhi. And then we have this Foundation for Innovation and Technology Transfer, which I lead here, and the Corporate Office. Now, this is just of three mechanisms I'm, I'm, I'm articulating or putting before you. Now, take it forward. Uh, when, when it's IIT Delhi's Industrial Research Unit, now this is more of a institute unit or institute cell, which was specifically set up to provide specialized administrative and managerial support. And as a matter of fact, the main functions include administrative and accounting support. So whether it's uh, sponsored research projects, primarily from government bodies, the DSTs, DBTs, etc., consulting jobs, institute sponsored impact projects, and institute also has its own uh, uh, money through which it uh, supports uh, high impact projects. Then, of course, uh, provides research grants to the newly recruited faculty, uh, recruits, helps in the recruitment of project staff. I mean, when I say project staff, it's research projects or whatever new projects are, uh, are, are taken by people. Uh, so, provides uh, recruitment for that. Then there are certain professional development funds, department development funds. Now, these are, uh, when we talk of professional development fund, department development fund, so these are basically apportioned from the institute overhead, so institute overhead charges that are levied on every time a project is done at IIT Delhi, the extramural funds, for example. So, and then intellectual property rights, even though it is written, but when I say here intellectual property rights, is basically uh, is a custodian of uh, the, or, or the, the ownership of intellectual property generated at the institute, no matter what, is of course uh, owned by the institute. So, and the, so very nearly it's the, the custodian happens to be IRD unit, though it's not managing uh, the intellectual property, but I'll explain that uh, while I move forward. Uh, with regard to the governance uh, of uh, the IRD unit and corporate office, so I think this is important because I think I'll give some uh, examples of foreign universities, why this is important, because these being extremely important uh, functions in a university today have to be led uh, by top serving officials of the university. And uh, when it comes to uh, the Industrial Research and Development Unit at IIT Delhi, obviously, much of the policy frameworks, etc., uh, uh, have to be finally approved by Board of Governors of IIT Delhi, even though uh, for much of the um, work, it's the IRD board which takes all the policy decisions to be ratified by the BOG of IIT Delhi. And then it's uh, led by a dean, R&D, who's... Uh, who stays there for a few years, and then, of course, it's by by the, the dean changes every three years. Uh, the dean is uh, assisted by an associate dean, and there are two assistant registrars, and also we have uh, the staff. Similarly, the dean of uh, we have dean of corporate relations. Uh, this was an office set up only about five six years ago to strengthen institutes' uh, relationship with industry, uh, and more particularly, try to harness. Uh, the CSR funds from from the from the academia from from the uh, from industry. Now, with regard to the functioning, uh, so it's basically you know these it's IRD uh, lays down strict financial and administrative protocols, and then there are unit approvals before a project is submitted there. And as I said, we have administrative charges overhead which are apportioned over different heads. Uh, like for example, I talked about the the faculty development the uh, fund and and the Department Development Fund, basically meant for the words of these. Uh, what is important also for you to maybe understand, I think this, I'll give an example in, uh, in the case of some foreign universities is about the ERP system, which is followed at IIT Delhi. Here, uh, what IRD has developed, if we call it an IRS, IRS facility, is very common, wherein it actually facilitates the faculty members for online submission and then seek approval for request proposals. Basically, it's about uh, an online system of submitting proposals and seeing where they have moved in the entire process. Now, there's nothing but uh, no, <clears throat> a lightweight that uh, directory 
uh, assistive protocol credentials provided by the computer service center to get this iris uh, operated so it's been there for several years now and uh, doing a, a very good automated job of uh, project submissions approvals and also finding out the, the the process where they have reached that's how it's it's been working uh, and uh, and now coming to the other part, which I lead here at IT Delhi is uh, what I saw called as the Foundation for Innovation and Technology Transfer. Now, this is an SPV, uh, what we call as a special purpose vehicle, which was created uh, at the behest of uh, recommendations of uh, IIT, IIT Council way back in 1986. And it was in 92 that uh, the government of India, particularly Mashadi called uh, present day Ministry of Education, which gave some seed money. And uh, so IIT Delhi took that leap of faith in 1992 to initiate this particular program. And what is, I think, I'll just want to draw your attention to the agenda, which was laid out uh, for the foundation. And I think you would appreciate uh, the three and four points. One, of course, adding economic value to academic knowledge and promoting an engaging goal-oriented R&D and bringing you know, what is called as a industry perspective uh, to the academics. But I think uh, when it comes to the core uh, philosophy or agenda of uh, this foundation was to ensure that uh, promising research resultants do not lose out due to inadequacies in research design and deficiencies of delivery system or lack of economic incentives. So I'll maybe discuss this, uh, maybe during Q&A, we can discuss this. And uh, very importantly, bring in the commercial perspective of technology transfer. So I think I, we discussed about two or three ways by which the knowledge or technology gets transferred. So I think this is where um, the the where I think the value which FITT brings onto the table will have to be seen. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's a, a very larger agenda, but I think uh, apart from these two, of course, motivate the faculty to address market-oriented issues. Now, I think uh, to, to translate that agenda, of course, we have a functional profile. I think I have modified this a little bit. One is, of course, research partnership and uh, problem solving consulting, technology transfer, IPR management. So I think this is uh, very important when I talk about IPR management. It's basically end-to-end -end, uh, service that is provided to the institute. Or rather, we say uh, the all the intellectual assets are managed by IIT Delhi, right, from capturing ideas to creating value out of that through technology licensing. And as I had mentioned in my one of the earlier slides about entrepreneurship and business incubation and reaching out to business and community, enable consortium, international projects, and now currently also handle the research park operations. So I think this I'll discuss a little later why this was done through this SPV. Uh, I think in a, in, a, in a comparative chart, I'll I think bring forth uh, before you the reasons for uh, why we or why the institute started it as an SPV. Now, this is a general slide about the innovation ecosystem, or rather the enablers of that. And when we talk of the stakeholders, I, obviously you would have these four major actors, the government, the academia, industry, and then entrepreneurs or the startup ecosystem. And then with the various institutional mechanisms, you have the science and technology parks, the business incubators and the technology transfer office. And I've given some examples of that. The prominent examples I'm giving in black, uh, the IIT Delhi's research park, the IIT Madras research park. The business, in, when it comes to business incubators, again, IIT Delhi was amongst the earliest in the country to establish one here at IIT Delhi. I mean, just uh, for uh, clarification, I think when we started this incubator way back in nine, that, uh, 2000, it's more than 20 years ago, um, you know, it was created as a platform for research spin-offs to enable faculty or students to translate their research or research resultants or projects into commercializable ideas, develop prototypes and see whether they can create a business plan or a technology venture or, or about their ideas. And the technology transfer office is something which we are doing day in and day in and here. And, and for those who are maybe interested in the evolution of uh, this technology transfer office or organization concept, in the, in the earlier years, it was very, I mean, the focus were very administrative, you know, performed just services, provided some services to faculty. And the formative years were about managing a, a side of providing services, also uh, managing a IP and technology portfolio. And today, FITD can be considered a mature office. And what is 
a mature office, a mature technology transfer office. No, no it's not just uh, FITD. I mean, no matter which university you would talk about, the more, uh, more particularly the, the the leading universities or I or the A-listed universities within the US or European mainland, these are uh, they have a host of services which they provide: uh, conduct services, manage IP portfolio, write proposals, create pilot programs. I mean, establish institutions, okay, and then enable the the academic uh, spin outs besides and and we're in for example at iit delhi we are also administering the ip policy all the policy work related to intellectual form uh, ip policy at the institute is being whether it's about formulation about uh, uh, implementation is all done uh, by this uh, foundation uh, at iit delhi and by that of course uh, some of the other functions which i will not read out well this is how it looks in general i mean these are this is state uh, marketing uh, slide about what FITT does since for the last 30 years at IT Tenor. Now coming back to IP management, uh, I mean, I just quickly run through this. Uh, as I said, so all this IP management at IIT Delhi is, uh, you know, vested in the hands of I FITT. We had this policy framed in 1994 and then revised it in 2013. And let me tell you that uh, I have no hesitation in saying that today many IP policies in the country have actually taken their inspiration from the one which we made. And it's a very comprehensive policy which was uh, developed. And I in person was also involved both with this policy as also um, policies of many other universities and institutions. Uh, I think uh, the, the reason I thought of adding a few slides to intellectual property was about uh, when we talk about collaborations. See, one of the things which I think was articulated in the NEP or the, uh, in the, the policy framework was about uh, working with institutions outside or, or partnerships with an industry. So this is where I think uh, this thing comes in, that uh, we are, uh, I mean, academia and industry are seeking collaborations as a source of new knowledge and technologies. And in the past, what has happened is many academic institutions have been quite amateur in their relationship with the sponsors of R&D activities, particularly industry. And when there were no IP policy, so many of the relationships were very ad hoc. And then, you know, when and then anything which is ad hoc can create problems. Can create in the long run some challenges uh, in the administration uh, um, in a in a university. So therefore, having an IP policy in place to safeguard interests and in collaborations, particularly issues like ownership, disclosure, commercialization, becomes extremely important. Because I I did refer to the economic perspective of uh, knowledge transfer in one of my earlier slides. And, and to, to manage uh, TTO, these are the kind of skill sets you require people proficient in law, science, and, and business. Uh, no, it doesn't stop there. Many times the university or, 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 or an institute or a TTO is called upon to actually build capacities outside. So I think this slide shows you about one such program which has been taken up by us. Uh, uh, with sponsorship by Bayrak, which is a DBT company, uh, to help uh, many universities and students, startups in an industry in managing their intellectual property and also technology transfer. So this is just about how we are doing with many, many incubators, many universities. I think, I think you can note down a few universities and institutes that we are working with. And I think we, we can welcome more in, in, our, in our fold to help them uh, devise strategies for managing their intellectual property. Now, coming to the point which I made earlier about the relationship between the institutes IRD and FIT. Now, see, I'm just giving you this IIT example, but I think I'll also give you an example from a foreign university about uh, the broader point which I'm trying to make is about uh, how two or disparate entities in a university or institute system can work synergistically. Right. Now, while uh, for for no, no. The legacy is such that when FITT was created, IRD was already doing some things. So today, uh, how does it plan uh, fan out? Uh, it's been more than 30 years. Healthy competition on service delivery because both are service organizations. So IRD at IIT Delhi is, is providing administrative and accounting services. FIT is also providing part of that. So there's some competition which is healthy. 
in service to but in some things sometimes well uh, there are some conflicts on some rules okay uh, some activity ird is also doing fitt is doing so here i, I would want to bring in before you the, the question of uh, human uh, element here you know sometimes we we say that uh, uh, some some functions become people centric or, or become a strong function of uh, some personality wherein the conflicts can go down or go up but then of course it's not something which is unmanageable because in both the cases uh, the director of the institute happens to be the uh, the chairman in the case of fitt and uh, and, the, and of course the chief executive of uh, the university or the institute and uh, what is important is a complementary overlap this which actually brings in the synergy to the fore and and when it comes to reporting the data it's always a consolidated figures on such activities and uh, let me also tell you people those who have worked with the uh, you know, with with autonomous bodies like uh, fitt uh, the the kind of flexibility it brings onto the fore is something which many people are, are associating with or aligning with given the fast paced uh, activities that we are all in and when when it comes to uh, comparison uh, let's say point to point comparison ird is an institute body fit is an autonomous entity ird has to follow the institute norms fit for sake of uh, homogeneity follows similar norms ird has boundary conditions of course being a public uh, funded uh, body it has to have uh, conditions uh, fitt on the other hand uh, can take recourse to flexible formats within the broad, broader boundary conditions ird counts are centrally audited the cag whereas fitt goes for third party audit which is so we go for ce audit Uh, well, I think uh, you know generally with with such bodies of the institute, the pace is generally fine. But uh, uh, FITT, with being a self-sustaining autonomous entity, for them, I think the USP is prompt service. So this is the USP of FITT: prompt service, flexible formats, and more importantly, commercial ethos. I'm not putting it here, but the commercial ethos means that we are. while we are not for profit body but i think uh, our ethos has to be commercial we have to work like a commercial organization in terms of service delivery and iid has a primarily administrative focus whereas we have both administrative and strategic focus i would say well it well it, as i said in the in the evolution of atut uh, administrative focus happened to be uh, how it started but then uh, as it matures it uh, tends to acquire a strategic uh, uh, role uh, or a focus uh, for the for the institute uh well i think it's i don't want to uh, make it uh, any uh, um divergent uh, views here but i think when it comes to scope uh, fitt has a wider mandate because of uh, the when it comes to the charter of activities i think this much wider than um, than the institute body for obvious reasons because uh, the scope of the work a scope of activities in many of uh, these areas in many of these outreach activities or missions is is very different so this is just uh, some some numbers uh, the consolidated numbers of the two bodies at iit delhi so i think the sanctioned funds were about 386 crores in 21 22 and the number of projects is 632 and there is a combined figure both of uh, sponsored research is also consulting assignments undertaken at the institute this is uh, these are some numbers about the intellectual properties that have been filed more than 1300 ips have been filed they have been good number of licensing deals and uh, some good technology transfers to the industry and now this i think i will want to bring your attention for a moment to this uh, some of the programs which got initiated or uh, or or were actually uh, started by fitt uh, but for some reason whether the, because of uh, policy challenges or because of uh, The, the the changed focus of that body i think uh, the institute took over for example we had this particular program which we started in the thick of uh, covid 19 as a matter of fact this program was initiated uh, to address many of the challenges which uh, institutions organizations startups were facing because of covid 19 so this is nothing but sustainable access to markets markets and resources for innovative delivery of healthcare now this is nothing but a blended financing facility now in in the conventional way i think this would be very difficult for any academic institution to handle so these are the kinds of structures 
or programs which uh, can easily be managed by a, a SPV like FITT. So while we started it, initiated it, but because of, uh, you know, there were some um, uh, policy level changes at the government, which uh, we had to now shift the entire structure. And then the whole thing is now done by the Institute under guidance or under operational control by FITT. Similarly, we, we had this uh, transportation research and injury prevention program, which is now a center of excellence in IIT Delhi. It was also started as a fallout of many uh, consulting and research projects which FITT did with industry. Similarly, with process safety and uh, risk assessment, this is another new uh, um, center of excellence which we created and now we have passed it on to IIT Delhi uh, as IRD unit uh, for managing because I think the focus has shifted more towards academics. And when it comes to more of academic activities or, or activities related to that, I think then it uh, goes to uh, to the institute body. Uh, are you with me so far? Yes, yes. Sure. So yes, uh, now I think this is just an overview of uh, how things happen at IIT Kanpur. I thought of giving another example. I think these are, can be found in open uh, in the website. So I, I'll, not, I'll skip this and go to a couple of foreign universities. One is, of course, Asia based, the Singapore National University. Here they have this Office of uh, Deputy President for Research and Technology. So this is nothing, same thing as a research cell you know, that we are talking about. And you see, uh, Mota Mota, what all uh, the stuff that they do, the funding resources for principal investigators, very interesting name, concierge, basically is nothing but again, uh, you know, navigating the faculty through the process of identifying funding opportunities, writing grant proposals, et cetera, et cetera. Grant management, research agreements. So all these are uh, similar to what we, our IRD is doing. I think this is... Uh, what it is, and then things like institutional review board. I mean, these are extremely important to take care of ethical issues, whether in research or in animal studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all these, uh, you can say, so administrative, broad administrative and management functions are being handled by this office. And uh, the very fact that it's a deputy president, which means almost like a dean level person who is handling this. Right? And then again, uh, they have this uh, what what we have at IIT Delhi the technology business incubator. So these, these people have what is called as NUS Enterprise, which is nothing but an entrepreneurial arm of NUS and actively promotes entrepreneurship and cultivates this global mindset. So I think, uh, what are, what are, these are the same things what FITT and IRD are doing at IIT Delhi. Now, let me take to, uh, let me take to a more, uh, uh, more prominent example of Stanford University, which I think is one of the top global universities. So here they have what is called as Office of Research Administration, ORA. So primarily, you know, same thing, high quality services and expertise to support research mission of the university, right? But it's a central body, like whether it's IRD or FIT, or IIT, so ORA is also a central body and works, collaborates with multiple uh, groups to provide expertise and deliver effective research administration services. And of course, uh, for the process side, they have you know all those things, what is required for analysis, for uh, managing the ERPs, right? All of that is uh, there in that. Because I think this is extremely important once the university grows and the, uh, the amount of research funding improves, the number of people, uh, particularly the researchers, their sub size and numbers grow. I think then you need to have uh, very effective IT systems in place to automate as much as it can be. And here again, it is the vice provost or you know a, a position just below the vice chancellor who handles uh, this uh, ORA. And like uh, with us here, they have separate uh, bodies. The office of uh, here, it, it's it, of course it's not a separate organization like FITT at IIT Delhi. Here it's a different office, uh, and here it's we call it Office of Technology Licensing which manages the intellectual property assets of Stanford University. And let me tell you here uh, that when we look at uh, the, the outcomes or the metrics of performance of uh, whether it is at Stanford University, MIT, Harvard, um, outstanding. I think uh, they were the people who actually set uh, these institutional benchmarks early on. And I think we are also now trying to catch up and come up uh, close to them. And because of, But they, they do set the benchmarks for us. And, but yes, we have to have our own metrics of performance study. Stanford Venture is nothing but another, um, is an accelerator 
and the launch pad, uh, sorry, launch pad is an accelerator in Stanford Venture Studio is the incubator. Again, separate bodies for creating uh, uh, entrepreneurs or enabling startups from university work or even outside ideas. And Launchpad is to actually help uh, the startups scale up um, from where they are, scaling up their business ventures. Now, believe me, uh, mind, they're all you know, complementing the institute philosophy of, of uh, doing a lot of research and, and adding the economic uh, value to some of the research results. So coming to, uh, I'm just coming close to my talk, uh, I think if we just look at some, I think I had these uh, uh, financial year, sorry, calendar year 2011 figures from some research universities of USA, just for example, Northwestern, University of California system, Duke, Harvard and Cornell. So this is a large list, but I'm just giving you some numbers. Uh, but I think the numbers related to Northwestern are a little um, in that particular period, they, they were very high, but generally uh, what you see with Harvard, Duke, University of California is generally the trend. About 5% of their research expenditure is actually uh, you know, uh, taken care of by the licensing income. There are a fair number of licenses, technology licensing as a, as a uh, technology transfer tool, the startups. So all these uh, things are you know done by their respective offices. And then these are the the numbers, uh, pretty impressive numbers. As I said, Northwestern's uh, is little, uh, I mean, it was unusually high that uh, year because of a very strong, very big licensing deal that happened. But I think the one with the Duke or Harvard, you can say is a, is a more representative of how the universities overseas, particularly the USA, are, are mobilizing resources towards their research. These are other numbers of 2018, again, very, very impressive. So, friends, I think I'll, I'll end by saying that if I have to, let's say, given my experience at IIT Delhi, so how does it work? So, we have an institute office called IRD or Dean Corporate uh, Relations Office and a special purpose vehicle. Uh, we have quite a few of them here at IIT Delhi, but I'm just giving you. Um, so, what I described was only one example with FITT. So, the, 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 it is HEI's cell, okay, uh, and it could be where the other special purpose vehicle for can be a separate entity within this, or it can be a separate organization, whether as a registered society or a section eight company in terms of HEI in the operate operational operations, the institute body or institute office has to follow the, the norms of the institute. Whereas in the case of special purpose vehicle, these are flexible. Staffing is extremely important because, uh, you know, people who do not have it, will not perhaps appreciate the challenges that uh, come with, with putting such uh, institutional setups in place. Uh, but in the case of institute office, there should be a small number, which is has to be core and they have to be regular people, whether others can be the project staff. But in the case of special uh, purpose vehicle, I'm, I'm giving our example because they are bodies, they're self-sustaining bodies. So they cannot have but contractual professionals. Here, I think here I have to emphasize on the word professionals because uh, uh, we can always outsource. As a matter of fact, this is a strong recommendation. We should outsource uh, uh, very linear secretarial functions, uh, routine functions uh, outside. But uh, the core professionals should actually be there as, as regular staff. The scope, it should primarily, I said, I'm, I'm not saying only, primarily uh, should address the government programs. The special purpose vehicle can have a wide charter, which we do. The focus in the case of the institute cell has to be primarily administrative, whereas in case of the special purpose vehicle, uh, besides administrative, it has to be strategic because whether it's about outreach, whether it's about, uh, let's say, taking up specific programs and projects, then having a strategic focus is extremely important. And strategic focus is, of course, adding value to the to the university system and it comes to the leadership well they have they can't be just left to the mercy of a low uh, a junior prof person i think uh, as i gave examples so they have to be uh, administered or managed from the very top in the case of institute office you have an institute empowered body which has to be there for the governance part and the special purpose vehicle whether a section 8 company or a registered society will have its board or a council I think this uh, was some of the 
brief learning some things which I thought I can share with you. I think this picture on the right tells you a compendium of the technologies of IIT Delhi, and this was compiled by and prepared by the Foundation for Innovation and Technology. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for excellent presentation, Dr. Anil Wali, sir. Now we will take few questions related to RDC, Research and Development Cell, from the director. Please raise your hand. Please note that this program is live streaming on YouTube. I request you to ask questions related to RDC only and be brief. Dr. Anil Wali, sir, will respond to your questions. Please raise your hands. Okay, Dr. Ajaz. Dr. Ajaz. Hello, good, good yes, morning, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, please ask. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Sir, uh, Dr. Ajaz Ahmedwani, Research uh, and Development Cell, Government Degree College, Doda, Jammu and Kashmir, sir. Right. Sir, this was a nice presentation, but my query is, uh, sir has talked more about the universities. There was not any mention in the, regarding the colleges across the country regarding the establishment and functioning of the research and development cell. Please, sir. No, I think please. Okay, this has to be this has to be considered as a model. I said it's a university system or an R and D system. So this can always be uh, downsized to fit into the college system also. Right. Okay. okay. Next, Dr. Ramakrishnan. Dr. Ramakrishnan. Dr. A. Mishra. Go ahead, Dr. A. Mishra. Are you listening, Dr. Mishra? Hello, Dr. Mishra, unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, very much yes. audible. Please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Professor Onil Wali, sir, for a nice presentation. You know, uh, Professor Onil Wali, sir, you have actually encompasses the st uh, about the research and development of IIT, starting from IIT Delhi, IIT Kanpur, then National University of Singapore, MIT, Stanford. Now, uh, what will be our takeaway message? What will be the, you know, whether we will we'll go for the Stanford or MIT or IIT Delhi? We are really confusing, number one. And I have another question to uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sakil Amen. You know, uh, we are in, in a state university, like I am from Vidyasagar University, Midinapur, West Bengal. If there is any uh, funding for the provision of funding, otherwise all these infrastructure, you need to grow some infrastructure for R&D. Uh, otherwise, you know, all these things, uh, we are listening at a very good student like this, but uh, I do not know how it will be going to be materialized. That is my question. No, I think uh, maybe with the, the second question can perhaps be addressed by Dr. Shakil. Yes. But I'll take I'll, I'll take uh, I've taken note of the first question. See, I think uh, please remember one thing. Now uh, you can call them benchmarks. So when we started in 1992 as a SPV of the institute, it was I think a small grant was given by the government. But then we devised our programs gradually, and I have actually given you this evolution of a TTO right from a incipient early stage office what was the, what were they doing just providing services stage two the formative years we started uh, providing services in the or managing intellectual property of the institute so please take baby steps or institute which doesn't have um, these setups i think fine i can appreciate that but what i think also please also note i said we have to first devise a culture towards addressing or maybe developing a research ecosystem in the place how does it happen first the people should be encouraged to apply for extramural grants, for external grants. Once it comes in, then, of course, there's onus on the institute or the college to have a system of managing that. So I think we have to take baby steps towards this. And, and of course, the setups which I mentioned are all mature systems. Uh, as far as second question is concerned, I think uh, you know that uh, right now there is no provision of funding uh, in the guidelines. Uh, you can send your suggestion to UGC, okay? okay uh, next, you, question, next question, next uh, question. Dr. Sango to Willem. Dr. Shakil, I can answer this question also, but I thought uh, because uh, since uh, I think I don't want to say something which uh, yes, then... Uh, yes, sir. But yes, sir. At, at, at the individual institute or university level, I can certainly proffer advice. Yes, yes okay, okay, sir. Uh, hello, uh, somebody is from Dalbagh. 
Please sir, unmute yourself. Sir, Professor Singhut was speaking. Yes, sir. sir okay, go yes, ahead. Sir, sir, from the Albag, I can uh, ask a question. Yes, no, you wait for first uh, the doctor, doctor Sing Sanibu, Singhut will, will speak. Yeah, yes, okay? sir. Yeah. Ah, okay. So I am Professor and Head Research and Development Cell of uh, Acharya Bangalore Bay School, affiliated to Bangalore University. So my uh, my submission to Professor is that. Uh, is it any provision uh, uh, there in IIT system uh, to support or handhold uh, the small institutions? Uh, small institutions, affiliated colleges, if they want to know do something in this particular space, is there any provision uh, uh, associating with uh, IITs? So I gave you example in one of my slides where FITT handholds uh, institutions, colleges in managing their intellectual property. So I, I did show that one particular slide. Uh, what you can do is you can write to me. I'll help you how to connect with uh, us or maybe the regional body or similar body in, in your zone and where they can actually help you manage your intellectual property, at least one part. Uh, but they're also empowered to also help you guide or, or guide you through managing uh, these uh, research cells or rather at least put up a research cell. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you so much. Gentlemen from Dalbag Education Institution, Please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very much. We are hearing you. Yes. So, sir, uh, I am Sanjeev Swami. I am looking after the R&D cell of the Alba Educational Institute. My question to you, sir, is that a special purpose vehicle like FITT, uh, as its CEO, do you always have uh, IIT Delhi professor uh, chairing the uh, FITT? or it can be an independent person also from outside. And if it is an IIT Delhi professor only, so is the person relieved uh, of all the other duties, uh, administrative duties uh, of his from the institute? So, uh, okay, the head of FITT is an independent person. He or she generally is not a member of the faculty, but at the governance level, at the council level, the director of IIT Delhi happens to be the chairman of the governing council, right? And in the governing council, we have some members drawn from IIT Delhi Senate. So this is, an, they, they are not regular appointees. They are just uh, appointees of the Senate of the Institute. It's, it's almost like being a part of a committee, an autonomous committee. That's it. Okay. Professor okay, Raishuddin. Professor Raishuddin, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Professor Rais, unmute yourself. Hello, hello, yes. hello. Yes. Yes. yes, Dr. Shakil, thanks for organizing this program. And I know Dr. Wali for a very long time, Dr. Wali, because he is also a member of our Research Advisory Committee Council of Jami Amdar. So anyhow, but uh, one we have to be very clear that uh, you know, uh, universities and colleges, they, they have to do a lot of effort to even come to the IIT level. And they have well-structured program of revenue sharing and revenue generation. So for colleges, as one my colleague raised a point that there should be hand-holding, like Mark Darshan kind of thing. Those institutions, those universities have well established research and development. So fortunately, our university has from 2010 uh, this kind of uh, uh, division. So uh, UGC through UGC uh, platform, some kind of uh, that kind of handholding guidance. Those who are already there, they can mentor other institutions and universities. Okay, man. They Absolutely. can function properly. So that yeah, is Professor one. Vais, you have given very good suggestion. You can write to us. We will think about it. It is a very good suggestion. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Raish, because time thank you, thank is short. Thank okay. You. Dr. Morgan, Dr. Morgan, please unmute yourself. Please be brief. Please be brief, Dr. Murugan. Uh, okay. Very, very, very good afternoon, sir. Very good afternoon. Okay. I am Professor Murugan from Dean Research University of Madras. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet a Professor uh, Speaker who comes from IIT Delhi, as well as Joint Secretary Shaikh Lakhmat. I had an interaction with him during his visit in 2012 with uh, uh, was, was committee members. Sir, well, I have a basic clarifications. First of all, let me express my thanks to the UGC for initiating such a wonderful initiative to strengthen the research 
through establishment of RDC shell all over the nations. And uh, recently we have received a, you know, email as well as, you know, odd copy requesting to institute research and development cell, both, you know, University of Madras or all state and central institute. We have instituted, we have communicated. Probably that must be the uh, first stage. Now, having listened to the lecture of uh, Professor Wally, he is comparing with IITs, comparing with the Stanford universities, comparing with the National University of Singapore. All right. These are all well-established, well-equipped, well-funded. And it is good that they can able to you know, achieve things. But through this kind of a scheme, how we can effectively grow at least on par with IIT being a state university like us? And what is the solid contribution that UGC is going to do through this way? Uh, we have 134 colleges affiliated to University of Madras, in which 88 affiliated, 88 affiliated colleges are doing wonderful research. But unfortunately, we are unable to convert the research output into patent, process, and products. And can UGC or you can suggest how do we convert these things, especially in terms of uh, financial assistance? Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, Professor Murugan, yes, I think this can easily be done. Uh, so I think uh, part of the answer was there in the earlier question is about uh, hand holding uh, the institutions which would want to first build a research culture and, and also set up uh, institute mechanisms. Okay, so while I gave the exa I, I gave examples at three levels, uh, top Asian university, global university and Indian university or in Indian institute. Uh, now, you are right, this takes time. You have to have initial, not just the money. The thing is, it's not just a question of money. It's a question of setting a policy framework. Yes, sir. Gotcha. Framework. Sure. And sure. Once you have, for example, for example, I'm a faculty member at your university and suddenly I get some money. So I know from outside, if I've got some money to do a consulting assignment or a sponsored research, whether the policy, because for making a policy, you don't need money. So actually create a policy framework within the university, which I'm sure must be there with regard to whether it's about uh, overhead charges, about IP policy, transfer policy, okay, how, how to deal with it, how to apportion uh, the, the budget of, uh, of a project. Once the policy framework is there and more and more people would then be encouraged to get money externally to strengthen their research projects. So this is how it starts. Then subsequent to that, whether it's about filing patents, whether about startups, this is second stage. And I know University of Madras is a very good incubator because I've worked with them before. <laughs> so yeah. IIT Madras yeah. is also doing, is anyway doing good in many other things. Yes. I, think, I think in your case, it's more about strengthening it and maybe uh, going up the value chain. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ramakishnan Sitaraman, please unmute yourself. Are you listening? Yes, go ahead, Ramakishnan. Dr. Ramakishnan. Dr. Parveen Kumar Shetty, please go ahead. Unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, sir. Thanks uh, for please the opportunity. Be brief because uh, only we yeah, have yeah, 10 yeah. minutes only we have to Sure, sure, sure. Uh, thanks for uh, Dr. Anil Wali for the presentation. It's a wonderful presentation. So this is a very good gesture by UGC. See, our series, uh, NITE deemed to be university. I'm a research director in NITE deemed to be university, Mangalore. Ours is, uh, you know, uh, established, uh, our university is established in 2008 and a very well established university. Now we have many extramural funds and we have a very well established uh, patent cell. We have uh, Institution Innovation Council. But uh, you know, I just have one query here. Uh, like, uh, I just want to ask Dr. Anil Wali, sir. So whether can we have an interaction session, in, I mean, the open house or something in IIT Delhi, in your fit, uh, this thing. So there are some, you know, the conference or something like that. So that, you know, so we can visit that place and, you know, so uh, FITT Delhi, so that, you know, so we can, uh, you know, see, you know, what is going on there. You know, so we, we got the information, we got the information. And again, you know, one-to-one -one interaction will really help us. And, you know, so our group can visit there. And, and is, is it possible, sir? Yes, Dr. Shetty, it's possible. We can always work out there. Okay. Professor yes, Dhanpati Deka. Thank you. Sir. 
professor deka please unmute yourself yes go ahead sir good morning sir i am professor d deka from tespur university i am a dean uh, r and d uh, and uh, as per our research and is concerned our research we are in a very good position in research our uh, i would say uh, still impact factor is 89 and uh, our uh, we have a as well established in r and d cell and ipr cell technology enabling center then center for innovation incubation and um, entrepreneurship as per i listening to our professor anil walia i am so impressed about the whatever is place in the delhi for and uh, enhancing the research activities but one thing is very important for me but uh, in the northeastern regions for industry interaction uh, because of the less amount, number of industry so can it be possible for a if i suppose on consortium between iit because iit guwahati is doing nice consortium between iit guwahati iit delhi or northeastern region tespur university other university for more interactive to be more interactive with the industry or industry can also be invited can it be possible sir yes uh, professor deka uh, in principle it is uh, doable uh, so i think it can always start with some specific programs or with specific uh, missions with industries wherein the resources from uh, your university or iit delhi are drawn in see these things are anyway happening i i also notice uh, uh, professor sunit tuli from and now shiv nadar university was particularly my colleague at iit delhi heading uh, ird uh, you know i see him there although his camera is not on he will perhaps attest to this fact that in principle yes this is works but i think you know we should know what exactly is the mission what exactly is the project that we have to work along with the, with with the industry uh, i can give an example where we have for example taken up uh, uh, fp7 you know these are european union projects which are international consortia where we are also uh participating so i think when it comes to iit delhi i can tell you that we are uh, quite open to establishing relationships with other indian universities to work with indian uh, indian uh, industry okay thank uh, you sir because we have very you know uh, five minutes only we will take only two more questions gentlemen from mahesh jain college unmute yourself mahesh jain college good good morning sir good morning sir uh, yes good Go morning ahead. ask uh, be brief okay, sir so i am working in a affiliated college uh, there is union college i am the principal of the jain union college we have a research cell and we associated with the uh, ministry of education for the innovative cell my question is the ugc can ha hand on uh, mentoring for the small affiliated colleges in terms of the research where the small uh, union colleges like us we have a more innovative research scholars are there who are working and the type of mentoring it is possible from the uh, uh, ugc side to mentor the whatever the projects we are preparing whatever the articles we are writing on the present sustainable climate change or the sustainable goals uh, i request professor anil sir kindly throw i think this question can be answered by dr shakil ahmed yes, yes. <laughs> no, definitely de definitely we will think about it you send your suggestion okay and now i will request dr swain please unmute yourself dr swain yes go ahead please be brief yes <clears throat> good morning and good afternoon to all the members it is really a nice presentations given by the honorable speaker uh only one question uh, to the speaker uh, sir actually we are the, the state private universities uh it is the initial growing university right now at nalanda but my concern is that uh, as uh, you know one of the professor said that like jamia ahmedabad university and other universities because they are already established in the research uh, part if you uh, you know suggest from your end to the ugc i think ugc will you know give the platform to the already private university or deemed to be university with the research part and they can mentor to the you know initially a new state university so that we can get the better you know informations or in depth ideas how to start our r and d cells this is only my you know concern uh, to professor sir so uh, dr swain i think the very purpose that we have we are discussing all this means that uh, there are many things which are in the works 
So I think uh, we are perhaps going in that direction only. Mm -hmm. I think these are the very important yes. steps taken by UGC under Mr. Jagdish Kumar. I am yes. sure all this will be met. Uh, Dr. Yes, Bhavani, last question. Dr. Bhavani, please unmute yourself. Dr. Bhavani, are you listening? Dr. Bhavani? Dr. Bhavani? Okay, okay. Now uh, we will end this program. I am really thankful to all participants who joined this program. On behalf of UGC, I convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Anil Vali sir for delivering wonderful lecture and also addressing the queries of our Director of Research Development Cell. I hope they will get the full advantage of this program. Namaste, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Pleasure, pleasure. It was my honor to speak to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.